Grace to you and peace in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and welcome to our second of our 111th Sprunt Lectures. My name is Clay McCauley and I have the privilege of serving as Director for Alumni Development. A few announcements before we begin. You are invited to join us for all the activities planned for today, many of which are shown on the schedule that you may have received at registration. There's a wide range of activities, reunions, and gatherings held throughout the day with a cookout scheduled for 4 o'clock on the quad or in the Holderness dining room in the event of a change in the weather. Stay tuned. <laughs> this morning, we will gather back here in Watts Chapel for worship at 11 o'clock. The Reverend Dr. Kimberly Russall will be preaching. Her sermon from Joshua 2 is entitled, Lessons from the City Wall. Our alumni luncheon occurs today at 1230 and is completely full. We will gather between 1230 and, I mean, uh, 1215 and 1230 in Holderness Dining Room in Richmond Hall. President Brian Blunt is our luncheon speaker. The luncheon is sold out, yet if you did not register for the luncheon, some limited seating for non-eating participants is available. To assist in transportation on campus today and tomorrow, the seminary staff gladly offers you a golf cart located outside the entrance of Watts Hall. Now it's my pleasure to call on Dr. Safwat Marzouk, Associate Professor of Old Testament to offer our formal welcome and to host this morning's lecture. Dr. Marzu. Thank you, Clay. Good morning. Good morning. I think you can do better than that. Good morning. Good morning. It is my joy to welcome all of you to the second day of the Sprunt Lectures. My name is Safwat Marzouk, and I am one of the new faculty members at this beloved institution, and I teach in the area of Old Testament. Our uh, opening song is hymn number 99, My Soul Gives Glory to God. Please stand as you're able. Thank you. 
purify our imagination so that we may encounter you anew in scriptures. Transform how we understand ourselves as we read the word. Give us the honesty to challenge our traditions when they marginalize others. Give us the courage to follow the truth that liberates and sets free, even if this journey is costly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. It is a joy and a privilege to have Dr. Gaffney with us this morning. She will continue lecturing on the theme of the 2022 Sprunt Lectures, Translation Matters, Who Translates God's Words and How. The title of the lecture for this morning is Womanist Midrash, Translation-Based Exegesis. Dr. Gaffney is the Right Reverend Sam B. Halsey Professor of Hebrew Bible at Bright Divinity School. She holds a BA from Erlem College, Master of Divinity from Howard University School of Divinity, and a Doctor of Philosophy in the Hebrew Bible from Duke University. She's the author of a number of books and articles and book chapters. Among her publications, a woman's lectionary for the whole church. Womanist Midrash, a reintroduction to the women of the Torah and of the throne. Commentary on Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah, daughters of Miriam, women prophets in ancient Israel. Dr. Gaffney is not only an accomplished scholar, she's an outstanding teacher, as we all experienced this for ourselves yesterday. She was recently awarded the Louise Clark Britain Endowed Memorial Faculty Excellence Award selected by students at Bright Divinity School. I learned that piece of information from Facebook. <laughs> Some helpful information does come from social media. She's also a mentor. She's a mentor who empowers minoritized scholars in the field. Last fall, she was among four recipients of the Outstanding Mentor Award, which is presented by the Committee on Underrepresented Racial and Ethnic Minorities in the profession, which is part of the Society of Biblical Literature. Yesterday, she reminded us that translation matters. Gender matters. We are embodied translators and readers of scripture. She modeled before us how to stand in the tradition, the tradition of sanctified imagination, while through a womanist embodiment, she expands that tradition to make those who have been left behind visible shining through translation, which is always an interpretation. Dr. Gaffney, we are glad you are with us. We are eager to listen to you as you deconstruct, destabilize, construct and reorient how we understand scriptures for the sake of inclusion, liberation, and justice. Will you please join me in welcoming Dr. Gaffney this morning? Thank you so much, Dr. Marzouk. President Blunt, yesterday I forgot to tell you something, and I asked my dinner companions, uh, Dr. Jones-elect, that's how we are styling the title now, and <laughs> Dr. Rosa to remind me of something. Neither of them reminded me. <laughs> but God. <laughs> spoke to me early in the morning and told me to tell you that perhaps my most anticipated lecture of the year in introducing the Hebrew Bible uh, in context is Santa, Daniel, and the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> Thank you all for your presence here today in person and online. The shape of this morning's lecture will be a reading from the soon to be published second volume of Womanist Midrash, focusing on the early prophets. This first selection is entitled 
Hannah and her daughters. Reading from 1 Samuel. Hannah rose after they had eaten and drunk at Shiloh and stood before the Holy One of old. Hannah's soul was embittered and she prayed to the Holy One and she wept profusely. Then she vowed a vow and said, Holy One of heaven's armies, if you would truly look on the affliction of your slave woman and remember me and not forget your slave woman, but will give to your slave woman man seed, then I will give him to you as a Nazarite all the days of his life until the day of his death. He shall not drink wine or strong drink. A razor shall not go upon his head. And it was as she prayed more before the Holy One, Eli was observing her mouth. Now Hannah, she was speaking in her heart. Only her lips moved and her voice was not heard. And Eli deemed her a drunkard. And Eli said to her, how long will you remain drunk? Put your wine away, woman, away from you. Then Hannah responded and she said, No, my Lord, I am a woman whose spirit has hardened. I have not drunk either wine nor strong drink, and I have been pouring out my soul before the Holy One of old. Do not take your slave woman as a worthless woman, for I have been speaking from my great grief and anger all this time. And the Holy One attended Hannah, and she conceived and gave birth to three sons and two daughters. In this translation, I follow the New Revised Standard Version in correcting the Masoretic text with the words, she presented herself to the Holy One from the Septuagint in verse 9, and I also follow in correcting with uh, the Qumran scroll of Samuel that is most dominant, the K4 scroll A, which includes the language Nazarite until the day of his death, and he shall not drink uh, wine or strong drink. The story of Hannah exists as a way to introduce David through the story of her son, Shmuel, Samuel. Yet Hannah is more than the woman who gives birth to Samuel. She has her own story, and her legacy endures in the scriptures and beyond. She is more than the incubator for her famous son. The text first presents Elkanah, Hannah's husband, with a distinguished pedigree, but the narrative follows Hannah. It is her story, and her husband is a character in her story. Hannah is one of two women with the same husband. While polygynous uh, excuse me, polygynous polygamy is permissible in the Hebrew scriptures, it seems to be class-based. The vast majority of men who are described as having more than one wife in the Hebrew scripture are wealthy, high-status patriarchs. Elkanah's two wives suggest that they, or at least he, has some means. Hannah's infertility <laughs> Hannah's infertility, <laughs> I'm sorry, I just saw the microphone seemingly move by itself, <laughs> but I knew it wasn't the Holy Spirit, because we were talking. <laughs> All right, Hannah's infertility. I know I've said the words Hannah's infertility like 10 times like a record skipping, but one more time. Hannah's infertility in relationship with her husband's other woman, wife, Penina, is contentious, evoking the discord between Leah and Rachel and their use of their slave women as surrogates in Genesis. Hannah is a biblical stereotype. She is a barren woman. It bears repeating that the ancient world did not know of barren men. Castration and deformities were a separate category. People were aware of semen and its general role in procreation. However, the ancients believed that male seed contained his future offspring stuffed inside each other like little Russian dolls, and women were the ground in which they were planted. That's why the scriptures use agricultural language like fertile and barren. 
It was literal, not metaphorical language. Humanity would not see spermatozoa, that is that there were solids in sperm, uh, until uh, Anton van Leeuwenhoek famously examined uh, the contents of his marital bed with a specially designed magnifying glass. And the ova was not uh, observed uh, by Carl Ernst von Bauer until the late 19th century. It was then that Oscar Hertwig advanced the controversial theory that conception required material from both egg and sperm. So Hannah's barrenness was understood as comparable to soil in which a plant will not take root. It was presumed to be the fault of the woman soil and not the plant seed or the man from which it issued. The authors seem not to know of agricultural seed that has blighted or molded, right? If you're, if you're a farmer, your seed goes bad. That's not a difficult concept, but they, they didn't make the stretch. <laughs> Complicating the presentation of barrenness in the scriptures is its use as a theological trope. Barren women are always transformed into fertile women by the miraculous power of God. This is in distinction from other miraculous acts, healings, resurrections, multiplication of foodstuffs, etc., which, while spectacular, are infrequent in the scriptures. This is also contrary to the lived experiences of women outside of the scriptures. While there are some women who do experience in inexplicable reversal of infertility, it is far from common and is certainly not universal. Infertile women outside of the scriptures must live with their infertility without the miracles of scripture and sometimes with the disdain for and heartache of infertile women in the text. Contemporary knowledge of human reproductive biology does not shield women from being blamed for their biology and reproductive health. In spite of the ways in which Hannah's story is at odds with the experiences of most hearer readers and, and the world in which we live, it remains powerful. Her desperation and persistence in prayer transcend time. In the first eight verses of 1 Samuel, Hannah is the object of the story. The narrator speaks about her and her husband speaks to her. However, the text does not tell us how Hannah came to be married to Elhanah. Was she his first wife? Did Penina come into the picture because of Hannah's infertility after some years had passed? Or was Hannah a second wife brought into the family after Penina had already demonstrated her fertility? Penina has at least four children. If daughters and sons is taken literally, that means there are at least two daughters and at least two sons, but perhaps more. When the women are introduced in 1 Samuel 1-2, Hannah is identified as the one and Penina as the second. Most translations interpret this as the one and the other. In any case, Penina is presented as Hannah's adversary. Her actions toward Hannah and Hannah's responses toward them are described without Penina uttering a word. In contrast, Hannah takes over her own story in verse 9 and following. Hannah gets up, Hannah feels, Hannah prays, Hannah vows, Hannah prays repeatedly, Hannah speaks, and Hannah has a conversation with Eli. Hannah has more active verbs and more dialogue in the narrative than does her spouse, Elhanah. The text says that Elhanah loves Hannah, but does not make the same claim on behalf of Penina. Neither does the text say that Hannah or Penina love Elhanah. This is consistent with the breadth of Hebrew scriptures in which men love women and women are loved. The single exception in terms of romantic love is Michal who loves David in 1 Samuel. Hannah joins Rivka, Rebecca, uh, Rachel, Delilah, Maacha, and Esther as the express object of her man's love. However, the text states that the rapists 
Shechem and Amnon love their victims, Dina and Tamar. And then there are the numerous loves of Shlomo, Solomon, uh, all expressed with the same verb. It's not clear if Hosea actually loves Gomer in spite of the divine command to do so. Elkanah expresses his love and caring for Hannah and trying to get her to eat when she is too sad or too depressed to do so. Elkanah is distressed that his love is not enough for Hannah. He claims that she means more to him than seven sons. Of course, he has children, and she does not. The notion of love between men and women in the heteronormative scriptures is one of the characteristics that transcends the temporal and cultural framework of the context, even when other aspects, polygamy, for example, are seemingly less familiar. It is not clear how long Hannah and Elkanah have been married and trying to have children, or how many children he has with Panina beyond the necessary four. The text indicates that years have passed by verse seven. Neither is it clear what prayers Hannah has prayed prior to this. That Panina taunts her every time she goes to the Shiloh sanctuary suggests that she knows Hannah is praying for children there. One can easily imagine that she prayed regularly for children at the sanctuary, that her prayers were more than an annual occurrence. The place of Hannah's prayer, Shiloh, is significant because it is the home of the tent of meeting, the Israelite shrine that housed the presence of God during the Exodus and their wilderness wanderings. Prior to the construction of the Jerusalem temple, the Shiloh shrine is the only place on earth of which it can be said that God dwells. Hannah and her family are regular worshipers at the sanctuary. Judges 21.19 mentions an annual festival at Shiloh. Since Samuel follows judges in the traditional canonical order, that festival may be intended here. Indeed, verse one, uh, chapter one, verse 21 mentions an annual sacrifice. However, the text doesn't mention a festival, so it still could have been on any occasion that Elhana was sacrificing. The years of infertility accompanied by anguish and torment, including watching her husband have children with another woman, a woman who diminishes her at every turn because of her infertility, have taken their toll. Now Hannah undertakes to make a vow and in so doing places the onus of fertility on God, whom she addresses as sovereign of the multitudes of heaven. For Rashi, this address contrasts with the finite number of God's earthly, uh, earthly creations with the one child for which Hannah is praying. So in other words, Rashi interprets her prayer, God of, Holy One of the host of heaven, uh, multitudes of heaven, you have the multitudes, you have made the multitudes, I just want one, right? <laughs> The Nazarite vow that she takes upon herself and makes on behalf of her hoped for child corresponds to the Torah in number six. In her vowing and praying, Hannah crafts an innovation that would change the Israelite religion and its daughter traditions, Judaism and Christianity. She prays privately, believing that God can and will hear the prayers of her heart. I mean, even Martin Luther opened the window so God could hear him. Right. This is revolutionary. Eli the priest is so taken aback by what he sees and having no frame of reference to help him interpret her actions, he calls her a drunken muttering woman. In response, Hannah does more than explain herself to Eli. She teaches him her Torah tefillah, her prayer Torah, the Torah of praying. Then Eli blesses Hannah and her Torah. In so doing, he also blesses her prayer request without knowing what it is. For Hannah never tells Eli about her vow. Hannah refuses to allow Eli to act as her intermediary with God. When Hannah returns home, she's no longer sad. What has lifted her spirits? Was it Eli's blessing or was it her own experience of prayer? 
The divine response to Hannah articulated as the Holy One remembered her is similar to the response of God to Rachel in Genesis 30, 18. There the divine title is Elohim and not the Tetragrammaton as with Hannah. Unlike Rachel who demanded that her husband provide her with children, which he could not do, Hannah has asked for her child from God. Hannah's story continues after the production of the longed for child. Uh, that is also comparable to Rachel. Hannah is treated as a matriarch in her portrayal in 1 Samuel. There is a tenderness in Hannah's raising of the young Samuel that is missing in the birth narratives of most biblical characters. Comparison could be made with Yochevet, Moses' mother, and her care to save his life and her efforts to ensure that she was the one to nurse him. Hannah devotes herself to the care of her baby uh, and later toddler, so much so that she does not go to the Shiloh sanctuary to worship with her husband. Of course, Hannah could care for Samuel at home, on the road, and at the sanctuary, but her decision to stay home with Samuel, and it is her decision, seems to reflect her need to keep him to herself for as long as possible, given the vow that she has made to give him to God in the care of Eli. Hannah tells her husband what she has decided, and his response indicates his consent, although she does not ask his permission. His response in verse 23 is curious. He invokes the divine name either to affirm the words of God or the words of Hannah. I use the uh, Qumran scroll here where the text is, may the Holy One establish the words of your mouth uh, so that what Elkanah is praying that Hannah's prayer will be successful. So let me skip over some of that. Technica. It is Hannah's word that she will keep her vow and bring Samuel to Eli when she has finished weaning him. It is her word that matters here. The text doesn't say how long she nursed him. Uh, Josephus and 2 Maccabees say that three years was the traditional age of weaning. Rashi puts it at uh, somewhere between 22 and 24 months. Did Hannah nurse him for the traditional period or did she nurse him a little longer to keep him a little longer? In any case, Hannah brings the young Samuel to Eli in verse 24 after a gap of an unspecified number of years. She also brings a three-year-old bull, three bull to sacrifice. In the Qumran text, it is Hannah uh, alone uh, who brings the bull and offers it. In some other texts, Eli and even Elkanah are present, uh, getting credit for her uh, sacrifice. In addition to her sacrifice, her worship took the form of the psalm that she composed and chanted in chapter 2. Perhaps she had previously composed it for the occasion, working on it while nurturing the son she would soon surrender. The power of Hannah's words in this psalm is attested to their use as the basis of the prayers of at least one subsequent woman and perhaps more. Psalm 113 shares Hannah's words from 1 Samuel 8, raising the, raising the poor from the dust uh, from the ash heap, lifting the needy, making them sit with nobles. Uh, in addition, as uh, many of you know, the Magnificat uh, follows uh, Hannah's hymn, and the song we sang this morning uh, was a version of the Magnificat. There is one major difference between uh, Hannah's psalm and the anonymous psalmist in Psalm 113. Um, there's no uh, enemy in the psalm. Hannah talks about uh, her enemy. She celebrates triumph over her enemy in verse 5, uh, saying that the woman who has given birth to many children is forlorn. forlorn. Um, she may also be speaking directly to Penina because she says, do not speak so many great words and do not let such arrogance come from your mouths. Um, 
Who is the plural addressed to other than Panina? Uh, did, was she taunted by anybody else in the community? Is she addressing Eli? Uh, the question is open. The psalm, uh, we've talked about the Magnificat, I don't want to do that part. So uh, Hannah surrenders Samuel, uh, and then she works on this garment for him. She tenderly crafts this, this garment and brings it up to him. Throughout the whole year, I like to imagine that she is working on this garment bit by bit every year, making clothing, bringing it to him on the annual feast day, and this may go on until he reaches his full adult height. Hannah may have lent him to her God, but Samuel is still her child. And every year, Eli will bless Hannah and her husband that they might have more children. Uh, Eli's blessings eventually prove potent. And let me also add that there's no mention of Eli uh, blessing Panina. Eli's blessings prove potent. Hannah gives birth to two sons, I'm uh, sorry, to two daughters and three sons. None of these children uh, reoccur in the scripture. And as the story follows, uh, Samuel, no mention is made of him having a family. In many ways, David and the nation are his sole concern. The text doesn't tell us if Samuel married or fathered children, but he was a brother and perhaps an uncle. His lack of partner and descendants positions him as a queer character in the text. Uh, I haven't published it, uh, but just as a short piece I do with my students, I talk about how prophets are queer in the Hebrew Bible because prophets are the most undermarried people in the text. Uh, so think about it. Isaiah has his baby with this woman that he doesn't marry. Uh, it's a whole story. Uh, Jeremiah. Uh, says God, tells him not to marry. I actually think that Baruch is his partner. Uh, Ezekiel is widowed and told not to marry again. Of the 12, only Hosea is said to have a wife, and sh that is probably a sermon allegory. So 15 prophets, um, one deceased wife. That's not the pattern of, of marriage for the rest of the Hebrew Bible. So, uh, so so Samuel is a queer character, not conforming to gendered cultural expectations. God and David are his primary relational partners, prompting one of my students to speculate that God was Samuel's beard. A, a beard is a, a suitable partner covering for an unsuitable partner. So uh, there are times when uh, gay men would marry women, but then have relationships with their beloveds. And the woman uh, was a beard. Unfortunately, she did not always know she was a beard, so that's a, a difficult uh, context. It may be useful for the reader to remember uh, that Samuel has a family of origin. So all of his decisions as a prophet uh, and mentor to a young monarch are going to affect his family, even if he doesn't have a spouse or children. Hannah lives on in the scriptures through her Hellenized namesakes in Tobit and Luke. There's also a tradition that the mother of the ever-blessed Virgin Mary was named Hannah, uh, which becomes Anna. Hannah's practice of prayer would become a foundation on which Israelite, Jewish, and Christian practices of prayer would become enshrined. Arguably, the moving personal prayers canonized in the Psalms stretching from first to second temple Judaism are in some ways all dependent on Hannah's prayer. And after the 70 CE destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, Judaism will build on the foundation of prayer that Hannah built, the house of prayer that Hannah has laid and transformed its worship from liturgical prayer and sacrifice to liturgical sacrifices of prayer, including personal, private prayer, such as that that Hannah modeled. Most Jewish and Christian women, whether woman is feminist or neither, who read Hannah's story, are not living in polygamous marriages. 
Yet there are many ways in which women through the ages have identified with her story as scripture. One reason may be her struggle with infertility and the toll that it takes on her. Another is that Hannah's experience of living in an unhappy home resonates with reader hearers. And it is not uncommon for women to have children with men who have children with other women, whether due to divorce or other previous relationships or due to infidelity. There are so many different kinds of families, especially blended families, with stepchildren and half-siblings and adopted or foster children, as well as children conceived through in vitro fertilization and with the help of surrogates. Family tension around a holiday table is a standard American trope. <laughs> For many, this tension is magnified and multiplied in a multi-layered, complex, blended family. The notion of women competing for a man's attention, affection, even love, is not unfamiliar. Difficult relationships between parents, especially when one is a former love or life partner who must now deal with a new love or life partner, are not uncommon. Nor is the spectacle of one woman using another woman's deepest pain to cause her further injury in the midst of a relational triangle far-fetched. There is no single legitimate womanist approach to biblical interpretation. I chose to focus my womanist midrash on Hannah's infertility because of the ways in which body image is a location of personal religious and ontological struggle for so many black women and other women of color in the United States. Other womanist readings might consider issues of child rearing, nurture, and surrogacy, or address the characterization of households and families headed by single black women as pathological and consider societal, cultural, and religious pressures for women to marry and have children. Hannah's infertility stigmatizes her in her culture of origin. Even though she has the privilege of being loved and desired by a man who brings his own male and class privilege, to the relationship, she is despondent because her body does not function the way she's been told women's bodies are supposed to function. Because Hannah's story has a happy ending and those of so many infertile women in the world outside the scriptures do not, I'd like to offer a blessing for a barren woman adapted from Elhana's speech. Uh, there's also, well, let me skip that. Uh, here's the blessing I crafted. Our love is worth more than seven sons. The heart of a good man would rather trust in a righteous woman who will not bear children than a bitter and fertile woman. How would Hannah's daughters have heard their father's words? Her three daughters are almost lost in Hannah's story. What life lessons did Hannah pass on about men and God, prayer and desperation, and the cultural circumstances in which they found themselves, judged by their reproductive fruitfulness and subject to an unwanted plural marriage. Intermission. That's, that's Hannah's story. Panina and her daughters. Now there was a particular man of Ramathayim Zophim from the hill country of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah ben Yurahim ben Elihu ben Tohu ben Suf, an Ephraimite. And he had two women. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the second was Panina. And it was that Panina had no children, but and, I'm sorry, and it was that Panina had children, but for Hannah there were no children. Now it was on the day which Elkanah would offer sacrifice. And he gave portions to Panina, his woman, and to all her daughters and sons. But to Hannah, he gave an additional portion because he loved her, because the Holy One of old had closed her womb. Now her rival vexed her. Vexation for the sake of producing contention because the Holy One had closed her womb. In all of my hearings of the story of Hannah and Shmuel, Samuel, Penina has always been the villain in the text. She is inscribed in the text as the other woman in 1 Samuel 1-2. Penina provokes the righteous Hannah because of her infertility, which she cannot control, vexing her. On the one hand, Penina represents the cultural norms of her people. 
On the other hand, she and her body belong to a man who uses her sexually, has children with her, and does not love her. Moreover, he publicly states his love for someone else. In some ways, the reading of Panina's story is dependent on whether one understands her to be the first or second wife. In a typical scenario, Hannah would have been the first wife and Panina taken on because of Hannah's infertility. This is supported by the sequence in which they are introduced. So in this reading, Panina does what a faithful Israelite woman is supposed to do, bear children and particularly sons. She has produced an heir and a spare. Her, uh, but the text does not say if Elkanah withdrew from Panina once Hannah finally conceived Samuel. That would be extremely unlikely. He may have understood himself to owe her, Panina, as many children uh, as he could to counter high infant and child mortality and provide for her in her old age. Thus I read that Panina continued to faithfully produce children for Elkanah, and she continued to welcome him, or perhaps I'd change that, to tolerate him in her bed. <laughs> and like Leah of old, she hopes that one day he will love her. The least likely possibility is that Panina uh, was the first wife because of the sequencing issue. But in that case, um, it would mean that uh, she and her fertility did not satisfy something in Elkanah, and so he went and took a second wife anyway who was more to his liking. And when that new woman proved to be incompetent according to cultural standards at what a woman was supposed to do, what was supposed to be her basic duty, and her husband did not discard her, but rather kept her and proclaimed his love for her, Panina became understandably enraged and bitter. This interpretation requires understanding uh, that sequence then as idiomatic and not literal. Both Panina and Hana live in an androcentric, regularly patriarchal society. They are each assessed by women and men on their ability to provide children and perhaps to a lesser degree on their physical appearance. In many ways, Polygamy encourages competition. They play the game with the hand they are given. My womanist midrashic reading considers what would have happened if Hannah and Panina found a way to change the game following Dr. Weems' reading of Hagar and Sarah. Some time after giving birth to her second child for Elkanah, Panina realizes that he does not love her. He loves that other woman, Hannah, who has not done what a woman ought to do. And so he keeps coming back to her, to her bed and to her thighs, because she can do what a woman ought to do and she will do it, but not anymore. Panina closes her heart and closes her thighs, and she opens her mouth. She tells him that she has done her duty. She has provided him with the air and the spare. She will raise them, nurture them, love them, teach them, and train them. But she will not add to them. When Elkanah returns to Hannah's bed, frustrated that Panina has denied him access, he discovers that Panina has been there too. It is her voice that he hears in Hannah's mouth when she asks him, if you love me so much more than seven sons, why are you still slipping into her bed? Having no answer, he withdraws, and for once, Hannah and Panina sleep in their own beds on their own terms. Act, act three, a sermon excerpt. Elkanah loved Hannah, but he seems to have had no love for Panina. He commiserated with Hannah over the pain in her heart from the emptiness of her womb. 
And he demonstrated his love for her publicly, but more than that, he demonstrated his partiality and preference for her love, her hurts, her hopes, in Panina's face before God and everyone else when they went to worship. In biblical language, he put Panina to shame when she had done nothing wrong and everything right according to their shared cultural values and the patriarchal system she found herself trapped in. And so she acted out. She acted out against the one who symbolized her hurt, but not against the one whose power hurt her and kept her in her hurt. That's how patriarchy and other systems of power work. They keep the people at the bottom fighting each other rather than joining together and tearing down the systems that trap us. <coughs> if you ask Panina, she might have told you that she was willing to get by on the crumbs of love that fell from the table of Hannah and Elkanah's love. In fact, in the lectionary, I pair this text with the gospel lesson of a woman begging Jesus for crumbs of healing like a dog begging for scraps under its master's table. In that story, what looks like a stingy kind of love soon becomes a full-throated and open-hearted love, embracing everyone and welcoming them to the table. Panina's story is a story of hard truths that looks more like the world in which we live today than Hannah's story. She teaches us that you can do what's right so far as you know and still get your heart broken. She teaches that people with power will almost always choose power and use that power to get what they want no matter who they hurt. And she teaches that no system of domination survives on the power of the powerful alone. Rather, patriarchy survives because patriarchal women embrace its bankrupt promises in order to get a little privilege, just as some black people and people of many colors embrace white supremacist cultural values and biases in hopes of being granted the perilous protections of being counted as one of the good ones. I'm going to leave you hanging on that sermon. <laughs> I recorded it a couple of weeks ago. It'll go out on the day one program in June, and I'll post that on my website. I t entitled the sermon, The Other Woman. Thank you. Can I hear an amen? Amen. amen? amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Gaffney. Thank you for expanding the tent. Expanding the tent, embracing all that are represented in the text. Thank you for inviting us into this move, movement and dance with the text, entering the text in different ways and multiple ways deconstructing, tearing down systems so that all can be heard and be visible. Just a brief announcement before our closing hymn. Um, we will gather again in this space around 11 a.m. We will be invited into a worship space to listen to the word delivered by Dr. Rousseau. Invited into thinking about the book of Joshua, chapter 2. Our closing hymn is number 3, Womb of Life and Source of Being. Please stand as you're able.